and welcome you all to the webinar jointly hosted by the Indian Psychiatric Society and the Indo-American Psychiatric Association. The Indo-American Psychiatric Association was formed with an intention to have advocacy for Indian psychiatrists working in the United States, as well as to find ways in which we could repay our motherland for all of the benefits we got when we got trained here and migrated to the United States and share some of our experiences from here with our Indian colleagues. So it's with great pleasure, I want to introduce Professor P.K. Dalal, President of the Indian Psychiatric Society, who has been so kind to jointly collaborate with us in order to make this webinar possible. And it's an honor to have Professor Jeffrey Geller, President of the American Psychiatric Association. I have known Professor Dalal from my days as a trainee in India in psychiatry way back in 1981. And I know that over the period of time that I had been in India in practice, Professor Dalal had been a leader in his field from Lucknow and has done tremendous work during this unusual times in the history of mankind during the COVID crisis. Professor Jeffrey Geller has always been a hero for me in American psychiatry. I recall his tremendous commitment to forensic psychiatry and state hospital psychiatry. He has always championed causes for the underprivileged populations in, in the United States and has really stood out during the COVID crisis, not only contributing by his testimony to the Congress and his other efforts in that way to educate the American public about COVID, but also he has taken a tremendous role in focusing on health diversity and how populations have not been taken good care of, especially the African-American population. And to this extent, his role in leadership in the American Psychiatric Association has been a tremendous inspiration for me. So without much ado, I want to get started. And I would like Professor P.K. Dalal from Lucknow to say a few words and then hand over to Dr. Geller. We would like to hear about what's happening in India under the leadership of IPS and his presidency. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ranga, uh, Professor Geller, and all the speakers and my IPS and IAPA fellows. Uh, this is a great uh, time and opportunity to interact between IPS and IAPA as well as with Professor Jeffrey about APA. So in these uh, time, we all know this COVID time is really hit all of us all over the world. And India is now peaking and uh, getting maximum number of cases in the world right now. And uh, uh, so this is really a very, very tough time for all, all of us. And as the pandemic started at the very first outset, we uh, came out with some ad advisory as well as some messages which were posted on our website and the social media regarding general public at large as well as our fellow colleagues in psychiatry so about it, how to deal with uh, our patients because from 25th of March, we had a first lockdown for four weeks. So during that period, it was a very tough time for us and then followed by several other lockdowns when the people were not, I mean, our patients were not able to come to us and uh, through telephonic call, through video calls, WhatsApp and all these things, we were trying to talk to our patients and uh, trying to tell them even for getting medicines also it was it was really very tough so uh, it is 
it is really uh, very very uh, i would say testing time for all of us uh, so we have uh, uh, send a message to our fellow colleagues that how to deal with this and as well as how to make the medicines available at at their doorstep so that they can get their get these medicines as well as through district mental health program we uh, through which our government is taking care of uh, mental patients there also we made it that uh, people should uh, uh, get medicines if they are not able to come then it it should be distributed at their doorstep so all these activities were uh, started at that point of time then we released a uh, position statement for the government that uh, how important it is that the mental health should also be taken into consideration and uh, as a pandemic and aftermath of the pandemic for preparing the policies and all these things so that was also well received and uh, after that we uh, with the help of nimhans that is the apex institute of uh, in our country bengaluru we prepared certain uh, e books uh, to be to be distributed what to do and what not to do how to take care of covid patients at at that point of time how to take care of uh, Uh, psychotic patients neurotic patients and as well as other things what precautions should be should be taken uh, for giving ects or rtms or or other things so th that book uh, takes all those things then um, with uh, our uh, suicide prevention uh, section uh, with uh, professor uh, lakshmi vijay kumar we we came out with a with a suicide prevention guideline which we also sent to wpa also and uh, so so what to do because of the economic uh, uh, breakdown i would say and you must have seen uh, um, millions of our um, uh, migratory uh, population they um, uh, actually travels from one state to another and that was a, a difficult time so uh, during th that period of time we were really scared about that uh, what to do uh, and uh, to talk to these people and to take care of their uh, suicidality kind of a thing and then uh, we uh, also uh, on uh, uh, 25th of april the government of india came out with a telemedicine um, guidelines actually and then we also came out with the uh, telepsychiatry guidelines with the help of uh, nimhans bangalore again and that is being uh, practiced and a lot of help is being is being provided through telepsychiatry where um, the, there are three ways that is one can um, talk to the to the patient and their family members or through through messages or through uh, video calling so that is what uh, we are even um, going for a online uh, survey in that in, in telepsychiatry that what are the medicines which should be provided for the first consultation and what are the medications which are required to be provided for the for the second consultation so similarly uh, all these kinds are uh, the things are being done uh, recently we have also um, uh, signed one mou with the british indian psychiatric association bipa and uh, uh, i was talking to dr ranga also that if similar kind of a things can be um, signed between ips and iapa i would definitely uh, love to have that then the next was that we have very recently we have uh, formed a task force for doctor to doctor for the impaired physicians i believe this thing is going on in your uh, country for a long long time so we have uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with indian medical association and uh, and ips uh, for uh, uh, doctor for doctors kind of a group it it, it has just uh, we set the ball rolling that as soon as it will be formulated and sop will be prepared and then 
uh, how to go for uh, the mental health assessment and management of of uh, our uh, doctors residents and all these things for the impaired uh, for their impairment and uh, how to go about it because uh, in in india we all know that the normal uh, uh, po- public takes a long long time to come uh, to come to us and it is it is not only true for general public but for doctors also there was a study in uh, in bangalore nimhans which show, which showed that that the doctors the, they took around 10 11 years to come to psychiatrist so we, with this uh, uh, i mean uh, i have also asked them to come out with a scientific data the scientific uh, documentation with international data that uh, how how many physicians what is the percentage of physicians which are generally impaired and what uh, what is the data so that they get destigmatized and they can come to us uh, as uh, as early as possible so uh, we, we are continuously doing with some of the other things as the uh, as it is coming we we are in a uh, we are also planning to come out with a child psychiatry ebook and uh, we are also uh, planning to have a gatekeeper uh, gatekeeper training program for the for suicide prevention so all these things are in the pipeline and we will be we will be very soon coming out with that besides that i would like to tell you that we have done uh, half a dozen uh, online surveys and on which three of them are published in indian journal of psychiatry very recently and uh, with that we have also added a platform of more than 650 psychiatrists on that online survey we have given this facility that if you want to really contact with any of these psychiatrists they are ready to talk to you on uh, telephone on whatsapp uh, by video calling uh, free of cost so that is a great help which we are providing all over the country right and there are some people like our president elect dr gautam saha who uh, personally distributed food packets to people to mask and to sanitizers and all all of us are, are doing that and lot many um, uh, institutes uh, and uh, ngos are, are are doing 24 hours helpline our university has also uh, g- given us uh, one number through which we are running 24 hours helpline in in this covid period so with that i would uh, like to end over here and i would request uh, professor jeffrey geller to talk um, about uh, his country what is going on regarding this covid time thank you thank you uh, dr gulal and uh, good evening to all of you uh good morning to dr ram and all the people in the united states uh, let me just do a couple of housekeeping remarks uh, first uh if you are going to ask a question please use the q and a function and not the chat function uh we will address all the questions uh, at the end uh i'm uh, delighted to be here this is my uh, second quote on quote trip to india this summer neither of which required me to leave my home uh the last um conference was delightful because refreshments were served uh, it took several weeks for them to be received but i very much appreciate those refreshments um actually my first trip to india uh where i actually had my feet on the ground if you are under 41 years old you were not alive when i made my first trip to india which was 42 years ago uh our biggest problem currently in the united states uh, is described by a term that i think comes from uh, germany uh that i heard some weeks ago and that is that we have a, a remarkable number of uh, what this person uh, refers to and I have adopted uh is uh, called covidiots uh covidiots are people who think that the covid epidemic uh is not going to affect them 
Uh, we have had many states in the United States that were on a significant downward trend uh, that are now on an upward trend. Newspapers are filled with uh, pictures of beaches with people almost on top of one another and nobody's wearing a mask. Uh, if nothing else, uh, the data in the United States would show that precautions do make a very significant difference. Uh, like I think the rest of the world, because the early data from China certainly indicated that China had this problem, uh, psychiatric problems uh, are emerging. And if the uh, influenza uh, epidemic of 1918, 1919 is any indication, psychiatric problems will last for years uh, after we have solved the issues with immediate infections. Uh, I think I will uh, stop there. Um, I can make remarks during question and answers if it's, uh, if it's appropriate. The American Psychiatric Association has been very involved. We have a, a COVID uh, reference page. We have had that uh, almost since the beginning. We've had several articles that have been in psychiatric news uh, that are public access. You don't have to be an APA member. Uh, uh, to get those. Uh, so there's no shortage of information. Uh, there's a shortage of uh, sensible people in the United States. The United States is, uh, many states are very into, uh, nobody tells us uh, what to do. Uh, a neighboring state to mine, I live in Massachusetts, New Hampshire's the state motto is live free or die. Uh, so a lot of people are living free and dying, unfortunately. So we'll move right on to our uh, first speaker. Uh, he has uh, an extensive uh, list of experiences and publications that you will soon see on your screen. Uh, and actually, they don't all fit on one screen. Uh, this is Rash uh, Rashish uh, Parikh uh, is going to... Uh, educate us on the uh, most up-to-date uh, information uh, about the COVID virus, uh, what's happened, and what we might expect going forward. Uh, Rashish, you're on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Geller, for your kind words of introduction. Thank you both, Dr. Geller and Dr. Dalal, for your introductory remarks. I am delighted to be on such a distinguished panel. All of you have contributed tremendously, not just in the current pandemic, but also to the progress in psychiatry. Uh, Dr. Geller, <coughs> it was a delight to watch you live in the congressional hearings in Washington. Uh, the way you spoke was a lesson in clarity and uh, in uh, communicating effectively. And I think you spoke not just on behalf of American psychiatry, but of all of us across the world. Uh, I'd like to begin with uh, disclosure. Uh, first of all, I am not a specialist by any stretch of imagination in infectious diseases. Uh, I got interested in uh, what's happening in COVID uh, sometime in January. And, um, you know, it's interesting that we're doing a IAPA, uh, IPS webinar because it was at a IAPA, IPS symposium uh, that I, or just soon after it, that I first got interested in what was happening in Wuhan. So the meeting was in Calcutta and Dr. Ranga and I spoke in the Indo-US symposium. And after that, we were drifting down the Ganga because I wanted to see the elusive Sundarbans tiger. And at that time, early reports were coming in from Wuhan of what then was an epidemic. And uh, we both got interested in it. The internet connectivity was intermittent, but uh, we were following the Lancet uh, website and we were deep in conversation. And I remember on the 26th of January, uh, me re remarking to Dr. Ranga that, you know, it's uh, the Republic Day Parade. Uh, there will be hundreds of thousands of people there and counselor staff from all over the world, including China, 
And if somebody there has come from Wuhan, uh, then, uh, you know, we are uh, in for a very, very trying time. And I remember Dr. Ranga saying that even if nobody has come from Wuhan now, uh, sooner or later, it's going to get here. So I, uh, you know, as part of my responsibility and personal interest in research, as uh, soon as we got back, uh, I started putting together a protocol uh, along with uh, Mahera, who does medical research for us at Just Look. And we were putting a protocol together to for the Just Look Hospital uh, so that by early March, we were probably amongst the first hospitals to be COVID-19 ready. And, uh, you know, the work on that uh, protocol uh, metamorphosed into a book, which has been uh, published recently. And so I'd just like to thank my co-authors, uh, Mahera and uh, Swapnil, and of course, Munira Kapadia, who researched over 600 uh, papers, uh, including books and articles, to put together some of the data of which I speak today. And uh, so let me begin by sharing my screen with you. And let me see if I can get it right. This is something I struggle with periodically, but I hope to be able to get it right this time. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, there we go again, Myra. I'm sorry, you trained me in this. But let me go back. It's perfect, Dr. Parikh. We can see your slides. But why am I not moving forward then in that case if it's perfect? What do I hit to move the slides? So while I figure that out, uh, uh, <laughs> Dr. Geller, you started by talking about COVIDians. Well, here are some of them. Uh, this is from a New Yorker cartoon, which was uh, you know, published a month ago, but I think it's still as relevant today uh, as uh, it was a month ago. Uh, so getting some messages on this. OK. Uh, excuse me. Zoom is sending me some messages. I don't know what they are. But. Uh, this is amazing. We just rehearsed this in the beginning. And I'm not sure why I'm not getting it right, but we will figure that way out as we uh, go along. I may need to kind of go back to it and uh, do it the way I did it the first time around. So if you'll excuse me, I'm just going to try and do this again. Uh, let me see if I get it right now. Uh, do I have my? Yeah, I do. Okay, perfect. I managed to do it. All right. So, um, you know, this is just a cartoon to, you know, show you the people who are in uh, denial. Uh, you know, Indian cartoonists are not so subtle. Uh, if they were to do this, there'd be heads of uh, people uh, on the animals, and almost all of them would be uh, authoritarian male leaders across the world. Uh, Professor Dalal, you talked of this being testing times. I assume you intended the pun. Uh, that's what we really need to do. Uh, these are times for testing if we need to move on and uh, get a hold on the pandemic. Uh, just to go back a little into history and also into uh, definitions, uh, we all know what they are. An endemic disease is one which is present in a low-grade manner you know, around the year in a certain population, uh, tuberculosis, for example, in India. And epidemic disease is when you have a sudden increase in numbers in a short period of time in a specific uh, geographic location. And then, of course, the pandemic, uh, you know, what we're witnessing now is when an epidemic spreads across continents and across the world. And uh, here are some earlier pandemics. Uh, the Spanish flu, of which a lot is being spoken now, uh, uh, about 100 years ago, uh, you know, there were 500 million cases across the world at a time when the population of the world was just about 1.7 billion. And uh, the mortality figures initially were estimated to be in the vicinity of 50 million, but subsequently uh, there have been revisions, and now it is believed that there were closer to 100 million deaths at that time, and that exceeds deaths in both the world wars, the one that preceded it and uh, World War II 
that followed it. In India, uh, 12 million people died during this uh, pandemic. And that, if you extrapolate to today's population, is uh, the equivalent of everybody in the cities of Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, Chennai, Bengaluru, and uh, several other large cities dying. So there was enormous uh, mortality at that time. And then there have been other pandemics, uh, the Asian flu pandemic, the Hong Kong flu pandemic, uh, you know, which is still ongoing, and the swine flu pandemic. And here is a scene which may be reminiscent of things that we are seeing across the world today, but it harks back to over 100 years and was taken somewhere outside of Philadelphia uh, during the Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, and just to get an idea of uh, how a pandemic can come in waves, during the Spanish flu pandemic, uh, this was the first wave. And the second wave, which followed a few months later, was far larger than the first one. And soon after that, there was a third wave, uh, not as terrible as the second one, one but uh, certainly larger than the first wave. And I'd just like you to draw your attention to what contributed toward this wave. And amongst the things you can read, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that there was censorship of numbers at that time because the war was going on and they thought that it would affect the morale of people if the numbers uh, were shown to be what they are. And again, we will see that history has an interesting way of repeating itself because we see a pattern in human behavior uh, during the current pandemic as well. And here are some other viral uh, outbreaks. Uh, let us not forget the HIV pandemic is uh, perhaps obscured in the blizzard of information that's coming in the media today, but it's still not over. Over 75 million people have been infected. There have been 32 million deaths. Uh, then there is the uh, Ebola pandemic, which uh, you know lasted till 2016. Uh, the, the prevalence was not high, but see the mortality. And then we had the second Ebola epidemic, uh, which, by the way, just a few weeks ago was finally declared as over by WHO. And again, you'll see the relatively high figures of mortality uh, to the people who were infected. And then there was the Zika virus pandemic uh, occurred in Latin America. I know it was a huge concern during the Olympics in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, here again, an example of a disease where the red was wide, but the mortality was not uh, that big, but it did result in uh, birth deformities, in abortions, in pregnant women. And these are the worst epidemics in recent history. You know, the, the SARS, H1N1, MERS, seasonal flu, Ebola. I'm highlighting this uh, just to illustrate that we have had enough opportunities to learn how to deal with an epidemic, how to prevent it from being, becoming a pandemic. And uh, a few countries have learned, uh, you know, South Korea had the SARS epidemic and they learned effectively from it. And the lessons that they learned in the past were used effectively to contain the current pandemic. Uh, but uh, by and large, sadly, uh, most countries across the world have not learned from the hope that we will learn for the future and that uh, the virus does not mutate. And the second wave, if it appears, as it has in some countries, is uh, less severe than the first one. And that brings us uh, to how this all started. Uh, you know, pardon all these chapter numbers. They are from our book. I, we had used these slides for uh, a, a book talk. So what happened in Wuhan? Now, in Wuhan, this is where it all started with one person, the pandemic that is affecting all of us across the world, began with one person in this market. It is what is called a wet market in that animals are slaughtered in the presence of the customer. Chinese dietary and medicinal practices uh, believe that a freshly slaughtered animal meat is more nutritious and in certain circumstances, even medicinal. So they have over 120 species of animals 
uh, ra- ranging from snakes to bats to dogs uh, and even donkeys that are slaughtered here. And it was here uh, that possibly from an animal or from a butcher, the virus made the jump uh, to a patient. And sometime towards the end of November or early December, the first patient uh, called patient zero, uh, we don't know who he or she is, uh, probably developed symptoms. Uh, We do know that on the 8th December, the first person sought treatment in uh, Wuhan uh, for symptoms which now are the hallmark of COVID-19. And, uh, you know, just uh, look at this. It took three weeks. And this was important time lost. Three weeks for the Beijing office of WHO to be informed by Chinese officials that uh, unexplained pneumonia, very similar to what happened in SARS, was being seen. Uh, Now, when SARS had occurred, the Chinese took three months to inform WHO and, in fact, even prevented a WHO team, which had uh, come to look at what was going on, a team of epidemiologists were prevented from uh, seeing any data. And relative to those three months, uh, this time it was three weeks, but that was enough time for the virus to begin its relentless journey around the world. Now, by mid-February, half of China, 760 million people were under lockdown. So while China may have delayed informing the WHO, uh, they were fairly quick in their response in containing the virus, at least uh, within the Chinese borders. On the 30th of January, WHO declared a global emergency. Uh, There's a lot more they could have done, but let's not get into that. And it took as much uh, as long as the 11th of February for the WHO to give the virus and the disease a name, and yet they were calling it a epidemic. Uh, you know, we started writing our book at the end of January, and we already started calling it a pandemic based on what was expected by the time it was published. But the WHO waited a while for calling it a pandemic, and you know, here's a tribute to uh, Jules Verne, of course. Uh, That virus then spread around the world in less than 80 days. According to some, it was just about 49 days. And, (coughs) excuse me, as of today, uh, there have been almost 20 million confirmed cases. And mind you, for most people, a confirmed case is when someone tests positive. Uh, Given the abysmally low testing rates in most countries, including our own, India, uh, it's very likely that there are far, far more cases than what are recognized as confirmed. And we have had over 700,000 deaths. So this is the havoc the disease has wrought on mankind thus far. Now a bit about the structure of the coronavirus. Uh, you know, I started with the disclosure that I'm not an expert in infectious diseases, but nobody really is an expert in COVID-19. Nobody was until January, even the infectious disease specialists uh, did not know much. And some of their hypotheses have held up and many have not. So in that sense, we are all learning as we go along. And just in a nutshell, I'm sure most participants have heard enough about this. So I shall not uh, belabor the issue much. Uh, The virus basically has a coat. It has an RNA strand. It's only function in life is to replicate. And uh, what is noteworthy uh, is that in the envelope, which is around the virus, is a glycoprotein spike called the S protein or the uh, uh, S, uh, the spike. And that acts like a key which uh, gets into the AC2, ACE2 uh, receptor on cells. Uh, Lung cells are rich in these AC2 receptors, and the spike, glycoprotein spike, uh, the S protein, acts like a key, and once it locks in into the uh, receptor, it gets entry into the cell, the membranes of both the human cell and the viral cell be fused together, and the virus hijacks the machinery of the of the human cell 
to replicate itself and then begin its spread uh, throughout the body. And here are different modes of transmission of uh, viruses in general, uh, direct, indirect, vector, and uh, you know, all along it has been believed that vector transmission uh, does not occur in, uh, in uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, there is a rethink on that as well. And it's quite possible that there may be some vector transmission, though there is, uh, it's, it's, it's clouded in uncertainty. And uh, again, to quickly go over what most people are aware, it's a zoonotic illness. It's an incubation period of anywhere from one to two weeks. Uh, there is an infectious period. And then R0 or R0, as it is uh, commonly pronounced, uh, that is an important uh, thing to keep in mind. And that is the number of people who get infected by one person. So if the R0 is two, then one person of infects two and two infect four and so on. And if it is three, then one infects three, nine and uh, so on. And, uh, you know, some of us may recollect the ancient Indian story of uh, someone who went to the, you know, wanted to return a favor that this man had done. And he said, ask me anything in my kingdom and it's yours. And he says, all I want is one grain of rice on a chessboard and two on the second square and four on the third square and not all the rice in the kingdom could cover that chessboard or to look at it in another way with a r naught of two it's uh, a question of about 22 steps uh, from the earth human steps from the earth to the moon well i should say human steps uh, uh, steps because you know the uh, 20th step was actually halfway to the moon and Again, I think we're all aware of this, that by and large, the cases are mild. Uh, men are more at risk for women. This is still being debated. Is it genetic uh, propensity? Is it the fact that more men smoke? Uh, you know, that, that thing is not yet resolved. But that's, again, one of the numerous things uh, that are being studied. I recall in the opening remarks, uh, Dr. Geller mentioned that if we go by the Spanish flu, then uh, there's going to be years of research ahead. And that is so true because, you know, the Spanish flu, in a sense, uh, in a sense, of course, gave birth to neuropsychiatry. After the Spanish flu, it was seen that some of the survivors had symptoms of Parkinson's disease and OCD. And then autopsies were done on, uh, uh, on these patients and it was seen that the substantia nigra, the region in the area of the basal ganglia were affected. And, you know, that was a time in the early part of the last century when psychoanalysis and Freudian thought had just taken off. And most psychiatric illnesses or even symptoms were attributed to childhood experiences or an arrest in um, a development mental stage of psychosexual development. And here it was seen that actually damage to areas in the brain could give rise to psychiatric symptoms. So in a sense, it's the beginning of neuropsychiatry uh, or the resurgence of neuropsychiatry because the beginning had occurred earlier and then it got eclipsed by Freudian uh, work. And uh, now how do we diagnose? RT-PCR, RT-LAMP, there's a bunch of serological testing, uh, chest imaging, X-ray, CT, uh, some uh, blood tests. We needn't dwell on them for too long. And we can see there's a wide spectrum of symptoms of COVID-19. And again, uh, this is work in progress, if I may say that, where we're learning more and more about uh, what the symptom profile is and how it changes. Uh, when we've understood something, uh, suddenly new symptoms appear. Uh, children, for example, uh, we thought that children were spared the illness because their ACE2 receptors are fewer, but then they present with other symptoms. Uh, I believe Dr. Ranga will talk at length on the neuropsychiatric symptoms. And here are the respiratory symptoms and uh, the uh, circulatory symptoms. And now, this is also subject to change. If you see the date here, it's in February of 2020. The first patients 
that came up in Wuhan. And it was seen that the most predominant symptom by far was fever, then dry cough, then fatigue, and so on and so forth. Uh, that sore throat is not as prevalent as people thought it might be, and the GI symptoms were less. But this profile now also, based on data, has been changing. I have not put up the latest because uh, quite clearly the last word on it is not yet in. Now, the mortality rates, well, it depends on how we look at it. Uh, you know, some have a way of saying, well, it doesn't cause that much mortality. But I don't think we can dismiss over 700,000 deaths with that simple statement. If there is no comorbidity, it's about 1.4%. On the other hand, now we are beginning to see residual symptoms. So even in people with no comorbidity uh, and who survive, so the mortality is not that big, uh, there may be residual symptoms which uh, you know could possibly affect them for the rest of their lives, as uh, did in the case of the Spanish flu. And with comorbidity, we see depending on the condition, there are differing rates, as high as 13.2% in those with cardiovascular disease, and it ranges with diabetes, hypertension, chronic respiratory cancer, and of course, not to forget that quite often people have more than one comorbid condition. Uh, people with hypertension and heart disease uh, could also have diabetes, and uh, then of course it gets the risk gets aggregated. And what about treatment? So we will see that there is a host of options that are available. And if you look at it from one point of view, you may think that there are a lot of treatments available. Uh, but on the other hand, when you have so many treatment options and including uh, you know, drugs like hydroxychloroquine, which get resurrected time and again, we also realize there's a lot we don't know. I mean, as Karl Popper said, that uh, you know, knowledge is necessarily finite, while ignorance is infinite. So there is more ignorance than knowledge in this area, but we'll cover what we know. Uh, anticoagulants, uh, such as heparin, you know, some of the Italian studies in the beginning indicated that blood clotting was a major cause of death. And so heparin has a place in treatment. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, it can cause other problems in people who have comorbid conditions, such as hemorrhages in the brain. So all of these treatments have to be weighed very judiciously with their attendant risks and possible benefits. A lot being spoken of remdesivir. So these are repurposed drugs drugs which don't have to go through the entire spectrum of clinical research in various phases because they were already approved for some other condition and now may have some application in COVID-19. Uh, none of these, as you're aware, is the definitive treatment. Uh, some of the results are in conflict. Some of these drugs like remdesivir, for example, uh, do not impact mortality in many studies, but shorten hospital stay. Others, you know, have come in and then gone in for criticism. We know the story with hydroxychloroquine, which, uh, you know, began uh, with the study in Marseille in France. And, uh, you know, that study's methodology left a lot to be desired. And then subsequently, it was the focus of attention in the media. And, uh, you know, it's died down. And then every now and then you get one study which claims that it works. So it keeps bouncing in and out. Um, antibacterials have shown to be having a role in combination with one of these drugs. And I think we should talk a little bit of dexamethasone because, you know, it's so easily available. It is cheap. Uh, you know, people are finding it very difficult uh, even to get the repurposed drugs like remdesivir on the hand. Other hand, dexamethasone is, uh, you know, very inexpensive and easily available everywhere. But again, the important thing with the immunomodulators is that one should use the right drug in the right dose, but more important at the right time, because given early in the illness, it can exacerbate the cytokine uh, storm and make it worse. So a mild patient may actually become severe. And given to somebody who's moderate to severe, it may modulate the immune response so that the cytokine storm abates and allows time for recovery. And then there are other drugs. Many of these are now available in India. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think patients and uh, physicians are met at 
you know, add a lot of hope to these treatments. And uh, we hear stories of patients running from pillar to post to acquire drugs which have not been unequivocally shown to be effective in the manage of COVID-19. Uh, convalescent plasma may have a benefit. Uh, you know, it's being talked about a lot. I am yet to see definitive studies uh, showing its benefit. There was a early Chinese study. There have been several studies which show no benefit. Uh, the large ICMR study, which is ongoing, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the results are not out yet. Uh, but, you know, many of us who become physicians uh, believe that it is our duty to prescribe. You know, we may uh, paraphrase Rene Descartes to say, I prescribe, therefore I am. Uh, and so there is an imperative on doctors to advise some form of treatment or the other. Uh, very interesting work going on in monoclonal antibodies. Uh, you know, last year there was a uh, there was a Nobel Prize uh, for people who worked on these antibodies in cancer. And uh, you know, there's a certain overlap actually between the principles of convalescent plasma and monoclonal antibodies. But again, I think uh, what all this illustrates to us is there are options being explored. No definitive treatment in sight which is why we go back to the first principles of social distancing, of masking. Uh, you know, Dr. Geller pointed out to us in his introductory remarks how uh, some people believe it's an uh, infringement of their freedom. Uh, you know, they perhaps wrongly paraphrase Patrick Henry to say, give me liberty or give me death. And as he rightly pointed out, uh, you know, it's not one versus the other. Sometimes it's both that come together in a package. And so, you know, for a long time, hand washing, wearing masks, social distancing are going to be the most effective way until such time as we find an effective vaccine. And uh, we're far away from that. Uh, you know, periodically, we hear in the media that a certain vaccine has been found to be effective. Uh, sometimes it is used in as few as less than 10 patients as happened with the Moderna therapeutics vaccine. And uh, the moment that announcement comes up, everybody gets excited. Uh, the stock prices of that company go up. Uh, the CEO and uh, the directors sell off their stock quickly, a practice which is not strictly illegal. And uh, then you hear nothing more about that particular vaccine. Uh, always makes you wonder that, you know, if a vaccine has so much promise, uh, why would people be so keen to dump the stock rather than to hold on to it? But having said that, and not to sound excessively cynical, uh, the movement on vaccines has truly been impressive and very dramatic. Even with the mRNA vaccine, I think within 60 days of the 68 days of the Chinese um, making the genome sequence of the virus available, uh, you know, it was sequenced and then made into a vaccine by Moderna. So there are different types of vaccines. And uh, as we can see, there are more than 200 in development. And they are in various phases in the study. Uh, perhaps our only hope, uh, undoubtedly, at some point, we'll find a vaccine. Uh, we can again hope, and I might add, pray, for those of us who believe in prayer, that uh, the virus doesn't mutate dramatically. Keep in mind that the influenza virus mutates every year, and which is why people who take the flu vaccine have to take yearly shots. And the way the shots are given, it's a prediction game. Uh, pe scientists predict what the virus is likely to mutate into in the next season and prepare a vaccine anticipating that mutation. Most of the time it works, but sometimes even that doesn't work. And although major mutation in this virus seems unlikely, uh, it still is a possibility. But uh, meanwhile, we can hang on to the hope that sometime uh, towards the end of this year, next year, uh, you know, there will be a vaccine uh, which will work hopefully as dramatically as polio did. You know, we've all forgotten about polio. We've all forgotten about smallpox and the havoc uh, they brought about on mankind until vaccines were developed. So uh, there is work in progress, much faster than at any other time in human history. 
and hopefully there will be a solution available. I'd like to talk for a couple of minutes on Dr. Li Wen Liang because uh, he, in a sense, represents uh, all of us, you know, or at least those of us who are on the front line. Uh, Dr. Li Wen Liang is an ophthalmologist. He worked in the Wuhan General Hospital. When he saw the first few cases of uh, what became known as COVID-19, uh, he alerted just a few of his medical college friends on uh, WeChat, the Chinese, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, version of WhatsApp. And he alerted them, asked them to stay away from the Wuhan market. He was censored. He was humiliated. He contracted the virus. And on the 7th of February, he died. Uh, his uh, you know, pregnant child was, I mean, his wife who was pregnant, delivered a baby in June who never saw her father. But uh, his death is not entirely in vain. There has been the beginnings of political upheaval in China. We allude to that if time permits in a moment. And uh, But you know, we've, we've dedicated our book uh, to him and uh, people like him who put their lives at risk in the service of mankind. And here are some of the protests for uh, Dr. Li Wen Liang. Uh, he, his last post has become like a wailing wall for Chinese people. They pour out all their griefs. Most of them get censored, but uh, many still remain. And he may, in his death, uh, in his unfortunate death, become an instrument of change in China, which brings us to politics. Uh, here is a opening sentence from our chapter on politics, which has now been disproportionately quoted uh, everywhere. Now, we're not complaining. It helps the sales of the book. But, uh, you know, we looked upon viruses as political creatures who can bring about regime change. Uh, some of us may be following political developments say in China, you know, uh, much behind that curtain of homogeneity and uniformity. Uh, there has always been a tussle between, say, the army and the Politburo, the civilian government. Within the civilian government, there are three factions which have also been at tension. And more recently, uh, cracks are emerging between the civilian government and the business businesses of China because they are being hit by tariffs. And uh, we will undoubtedly see political change across the world as a uh, as a result of this pandemic uh, and again uh, you know that is something that is in progress uh, politics sometimes is like the elephant in the room uh, we choose to ignore it it's not civil discourse on a dinner table for example but at the end of the day politics determines policy and policy affects every one of us and during the pandemic, uh, social media has come into its own. Just before the pandemic, it was under heavy criticism from all sides. And of course, during the pandemic also recently, there have been hearings in Congress. Um, you know, social media look like a behemoth, the cliche that's often used for these uh, corporations who wanted to control uh, information related to us. But in the pandemic, you know, they have also come into their own with Telemedicine, uh, Dr. Dalal talked about it in the beginning, the spread of public health information, rapid dissemination of information, not just with the public, but among scientists, uh, the Johns Hopkins dashboard, which uh, perhaps is uh, looked upon now more reliably than the WHO dashboard, and all of this information. And, you know, we've been talking of social distancing again, when we wrote our book in January, we suggested I think it was in February that we suggested that we should use uh, the phrase physical distancing because uh, social media now has made social distancing unnecessary, the, the term. So it's just a semantic thing that, uh, you know, people are being socially connected, although physically distant. So when we complain about social media, let us not forget that it has and will continue to play an important role in times of in our lives, particularly in difficult times like this. And of course, as with everything else, uh, there have been issues. Uh, social media gets censored. You're never sure of the information that's coming out. The WHO 
you know, before declaring COVID-19 as a pandemic, they declared uh, the misinformation as an infodemic. And then there has been increase in cybercrime, xenophobia, racism. Uh, but, you know, one way we like to look at it, it's not as if these things didn't exist in our society. Uh, I did a little cartoon one day in which I showed the virus looking at humanity through a microscope, you know, just turning the microscope on us. And, uh, you know, we've always had cracks, uh, you know, racism, xenophobia, all that has been there. Uh, inequity, more important in healthcare, has always been there. Uh, inequity for mentally ill patients has always been there. And what the virus has done, what the pandemic has done, is exposed these cracks and perhaps made some of them into larger fissures. And uh, here's the economics of the pandemic, uh, the global cost, $9 trillion. I think after a point, you know, one loses track of the zeros and what they mean. But I think uh, this uh, bar diagram, uh, it's a bit unlike the one that President Trump uh, displayed uh, to Mr. Sean the other day. It is uh, showing us, you know, how uh, economies are expected to contract. Uh, but I think this might give us a better idea. I think many of us would recollect the 2008 financial crisis. I think it uh, left its mark in economies across the world and stimulus packages were brought in. Uh, you know, President Obama and his team did a wonderful job in the United States. But if you see the packages that were required in 2008 and compare them to the packages that are going to be required for this pandemic thus far, we get a clearer idea of the huge economic uh, toll on the world, uh, currently exceeding $10 trillion, but the numbers are just going up. Uh, and this is an idea of unemployment. Uh, you know, we often, or at least economists, often look at statistics, at pie charts, at data, as numbers. Uh, there's a human toll, people unemployed, families starving, and sometimes, or these days quite often, in um, amongst the most developed countries in the world as well. Uh, so that is the tragedy of day-to-day -day life of people. And mind you, these are not people who are necessarily ill. They're just experiencing the after effects of the illness. Uh, and finally, so what's going to happen beyond COVID-19? One of the things that has emerged is artificial intelligence uh, in virotherapy uh, at MIT. AI uh, brought about an antibiotic called Halicin. Uh, you know, it's named after HAL in 2001, a space odyssey. Uh, and that has shown a tremendous promise, uh, at least uh, uh, not, not, not in COVID-19, uh, but uh, at least showed tremendous promise in some work in uh, lab cultures. Uh, and then, of course, now we will start repurposing drugs uh, to, you know, make the process quicker uh, between uh, drug discovery and uh, effective treatment. And then let us not forget when we talk of treatment, uh, the important part of treatment is diagnosis. Uh, I remember my professor, Dr. Dungaji, would ask all the new residents, what are the three most important steps in treating people? And, uh, you know, he didn't even give you time to answer. And he said, diagnosis, diagnosis, and diagnosis. So diagnosis is the first critical step. And, uh, you know, Chinese and American companies are, you know, making diagnosis possible faster. The, uh, you know, a CT scan can be read in 10 to 12 seconds uh, by a computer as opposed to the 10 minutes or sometimes even 15 minutes that a trained radiologist might require. So that is a development. And what are the lessons? I come to the last part of my talk. What have we learned? Or what can we learn? And uh, this is not a comprehensive list. Uh, there is a lot we have to learn as we go along. Uh, but the idea that there was a socioeconomic or geographic separation uh, between humanity may now become redundant because we're only as safe as the weakest amongst us. I think we've used a phrase in our book, Myra, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, where we've said that as long as one of us is unsafe, all of us are unsafe. Uh, we've said this time and again, we've uh, you know paraphrased uh, Alexander Pope to say, you know, when the bells toll, 
for a victim in Zimbabwe. They told just as loudly for the senators in Washington. And, you know, the world has got far more connected, interconnected with this virus. Uh, the, and we have to ensure a certain equity of healthcare because, uh, you know, if the poor are ill, the rich will sooner or later fall ill too and succumb to the illness. We've also learned that politics, power, money cannot save us from this pandemic. Science, research, frontline workers, physicians who are willing to put their lives on the line in the service of humanity, they are the ones. Look at the large number of healthcare workers affected around the world, the large number of people who have died in India, died in the US, young people. Uh, and uh, no matter how much technology we have, we're still going to have to depend on humans who are willing to work with compassion, uh, as has been the case for centuries. And that's a lesson of COVID-19. Uh, technology is here to stay, to use a cliche, uh, and its role is only going to become more important in future. Uh, the need for self-reliance of nations has now emerged strongly. And then, you know, we've all had time to reflect, uh, time to ask ourselves what really matters. Uh, you know, Stephen Covey has written about uh, the important things in life as versus the urgent things in life. And I think the pandemic has given, at an individual level, uh, most of mankind, time to reflect on the phase essential. We talk of essential services. But what is truly essential to us, uh, for me at least, uh, one of the lessons of the pandemic has been to reprioritize uh, my life at least. And for many of us, uh, that may be a lesson of COVID-19, that how do we want to lead our lives in future? What really matters? Is it family? Is it friends? Or is it a designation or a title at the job? Is it the next race? And I think that's an important lesson of this pandemic, which many of us were living in a historic time that mankind will talk about from time to time are active participants in. Uh, that should be it, yes. Uh, so I have uh, attempted in the time given to me to cover various aspects, not just the biological, but the political, economic, uh, social, etc. Uh, I have intentionally uh, glossed over the neuropsychiatric aspects because we have a very competent uh, speaker, Dr. Uh, Ram Ranga, to talk about it. Uh, he also is perhaps the best person in this symposium because he is trained in India and the US and has had the best uh, people to train him in both places. He trained with uh, Professor Venkoba Rao, who is a legend and one of the early biological psychiatrists in the country. Uh, thereafter, he was at the Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. We overlapped for some time uh, during the time that I uh, trained in Hopkins in neuropsychiatry. And I've always been impressed with his desire for knowledge and his willingness to do things. Uh, he is board certified in general and addiction psychiatry. Uh, he now specializes in TMS. But I think what the subtext uh, behind all this is his passion uh, or his compassion, I might say. Uh, he has worked tirelessly in the state of Delaware when he was the in charge of the mental health program over there to help homeless people get adequate mental health coverage. And that's something that he continues to do today uh, in the United States while uh, doing whatever he can uh, individually and in his capacity as president-elect of the Indo-American Psychiatric Association to bridge the mental health services, the gap in uh, mental health services between India and the United States. Uh, Ram, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And thank you for putting this symposium together. And uh, thank you, Mayra, Swapi, Munira, for helping me to put these slides together. Thank you very much, Rajesh. Uh, you know, folks, it's always a difficult act to follow. If you can stop sharing your screen, I'll go on to my screen, Rajesh. Oh, oh, I didn't know how to start sharing it. Now let me see. Oh, yeah, that's easy. The red button. Stop share. Well, no. Okay. Well, I'm going to have a second to figure out where my uh, slide is. Yeah. 
have you exited yeah. are you able to see me now yeah very clearly ram all right we can see you but not your slides oh what i want to show is only my slides <laughs> all right let me let me take you're a looking, stand again you're looking suave ram perhaps better than the slides well let me get the slides going and share screen after that hmm. pardon me for wasting your time uh i'm going to give it one more shot where did the zoom screen go Uh, Mara, you want to just step in and guide Ram the way you guided me. Uh, Mara, I think it's like sure. the Cheshire cat. She just left her smile for us. Oh, you are there. I yeah, thought you I'm disappeared right like here. the cat, leaving your smile behind. Not at all. I'm right here. Uh, Dr. Okay. Ram, are you being able to share and get an option of what you'd like to share? Make this big. Uh, okay, here. All right. Big. And then here. Share screen. and where did you open your uh, yeah yet? yeah my file is open okay. so it should come up right there ah. yeah. well i am sharing now yes absolutely we can see you if you could just put it on a slide show mode so it would yeah get the whole screen sorry about that i dr ram i see you needed your supervisor to help you there i know see you saw her come <laughs> yeah I know. Yeah, she's my, my she's my supervisor too, Doctor Geller. <laughs> my boss. That uh, that's who I depend on. Anyway, uh, today the uh, pandemic has afflicted five million cases, and I'm very sorry I did not update this part. And as everyone recognizes, because of the excellent press coverage, it has been an epic failure on several fronts in the United States. Our leadership failed to understand basic epidemiology. They kind of made. a false choice between health and economy employment has plummeted virtually all the employment gained since the previous administration have been lost long standing health disparities which america has chosen to ignore have all been recognized now and with the black lives matter movement which was essentially directed towards unfairness of the police has now extended to understanding not only health disparities but also disparities of opportunity across the board and america is really going through a phase of social change that dr parikh referred to at the core of it all is lack of empathy of the leadership and that is probably what is uh, making it so difficult so let's start with the neuropsychiatric symptoms uh because dr parikh has covered a lot of it i would say that anosmia and agusia i just like these latin terms because they seem to suggest that i'm um uh, educated in a catholic school which i am not unlike rajesh uh but agusia stands for a uh, loss of taste initially it was not widely recognized 5% in china and then now we say that about 85% have some kind of neuropsychiatric symptoms and these symptoms include altered mental status strokes seizures or even complete delirious states uh, dr solomon from mgh recently published his autopsies where he said that the cerebral cortex is involved thalamus is involved basal ganglia is involved he was somewhat surprised that there were uh, viruses only in some areas of the brain but what seemed to cause most of the problem as dr saha had said in one of the comments was damage due to oxygen deprivation and clots so these were the things and dh lawrence many many years ago had a lesson for uh, doctors when he wrote without really addressing the dots what the eye does not see the mind does not know it doesn't exist in india there was a research paper nicely done from nimhans 
uh, by Dr. Damodaran Dinakaran, which talked about the various uh, mental health uh, related neuropsychiatric symptoms. And he stressed, among other things, the sleep wake rhythm abnormalities, which has got some implications for this talk. So the psychiatric symptoms include depression and anxiety, sleep deprivation, overwork, stigma is associated among healthcare workers. And this is something that has been uh, covered in the press uh, with even violence against doctors and nurses in India. And that is adding to a certain layer. I know friends of mine who work in emergency rooms who just check into the hotel across from the hospital and not even go home and try to uh, get back to work and not, not drive back and forth and so on. Uh, psychiatric symptoms and psychological distress among the general public has really highlighted the need for public health education, which we have not done a good job of in the United States so far, in order to help people understand the various aspects of COVID, which we could have done in all these months. I think efforts by Dr. Geller and others is beginning to have an impact, although we are not there yet. So the mechanisms is viral infiltrations into the CNS, which seems to be minimal, but there seems to be other ways in which the virus impacts various areas of the brain. Uh, we know the cytokine network dysregulation can result in either lack of immunity or in other cases, uh, there can be a cytokine storm, both of which are um, causing severe comorbidity, uh, uh, severe morbidity and even mortality. So we should hold in our minds the lessons learned from other major viral infections which have had long-term sequelae and so we should be prepared for things that will follow once we get through this. The most recent information that I have is two pre-publications, one from Mass General Hospital and the other from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. So the Mass General Hospital talked predominantly about delirium and they stressed the use of melatonin and they feel that melatonin due to its sedating effects and through circadian rhythm uh, management via increased brain derived neurotropic expression seems to help as well as helps with NMDA. NMDA excitotoxicity is thought of as one of the ways in which nerve cells are lost. The other way in which this is being a approached delirium is use of alpha-2 agonists. The better known one is clonidine, but uh, dexmedetamine has been studied recently. In the Mount Sinai review, which is in press in psychosomatics, the senior author, Carrie Ernst, who is pretty well known to me and I'm very fond of her excellent work, has been talking about the various medications and the neuropsychiatric uh, comorbidities that are usually associated with these medications such as hydroxychloroquine and even steroidal medications. And a psychiatrist working with the medical team can help them understand some of the consequences. Uh, it's very important to differentiate between what would be primary psychiatric symptoms versus symptoms secondary to COVID medications. And this is the area that this paper focuses on and it should be out in press shortly. So I would suggest people look for it. One of the things all the major journals have done is to make COVID-19 related articles freely available to the public as well as to all of us in our profession. So fluoxamine is uh, being studied for inflammatory response uh, because during sepsis, it can decrease cytokine production. In summary, psychiatrists must be aware of the likelihood of encountering patients with COVID-19 and we must remain cognizant of the neuropsychiatric effects as well as the drug-drug interactions, which are very important. Remdesivir, which is widely used in the United States, certainly can increase serum transaminases. So if a patient is on valproic acid, for instance, it may have implications for their liver functioning. Uh, I would not dwell too much on this paper, but I can tell you that this is one of the most comprehensive papers that is due to come out. The last uh, the senior author is Carrie Ernst, E-R-N-S-T. She sent it to me. I don't know the other authors yet. So I have a preliminary draft, but I'm pretty certain it will be available in the next day or two. 
evolution of the virus has sort of been one of the reasons why we think there is a classic uh, change in the way this RNA virus is expressing itself compared to uh, any of the previously known uh, viruses from this group. What do we expect in psychiatry? It's really not very easy to make these kinds of predictions. Um, I, I always think of Yogi Berra, who says it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, the epidemiologic studies done by the Kaiser Foundation, which is very reputable, says that more than half of the population of the United States have their mental health negatively impacted. So the next year, you can expect that there will be an oncoming mental health epidemic, and I hope not, it could be a pandemic, a mental health pandemic with depression, anxiety, trauma-related symptoms that will follow. I also worry about neuropsychiatric symptoms that have traditionally followed various viral infections, um, and we learned about them as we went along. So there are psychological reactions, there are distress reactions, there are health risk behaviors, increased drug use, increased uh, domestic violence, and there are clear-cut diagnosable mental disorders as well. So distress occurs very early with any adversity. There are feelings of vulnerability. There is anger towards the leadership, and I'm no exception to it. There is demoralization, insomnia, increased use of alcohol, tobacco, self-isolation, and so on. So I would say that we should screen patients for all of this. We should advocate for physical health, physical activity, exercise, and diet. We should encourage meditation and other ways of reducing stress, identify stress triggers, ask patients to limit their exposure to distressing news media, and to focus on positive thoughts. So increase your interactions with family. Physical distancing does not mean social distancing. And that would be my quick summary of the mental health aspects of COVID-19. I want to take a minute to thank you, and I will take your questions at the end. I'm sure I went very fast through this, and I want to take a minute to introduce the next speaker, Mahara Desai. Mahara is a clinical psychologist at Jaslok who works with Dr. Rajesh Parikh and is a co-author of the book on coronavirus. She is young with maturity beyond her years, and she has done an excellent job of putting up information about the psychosocial aspects of COVID-19. Without much ado, Mahara Desai. Thank you for the lovely presentation, Dr. Ram. It was, it's always difficult to speak after you. Uh, I'm going to try and keep up. Let me quickly share my slide. I believe you all can see the screen now. If just one person can confirm that for me, I can take it forward from you. Yes, Myra, we can. All right. Thank you, Dr. Pahari. Yes, we can. That was a campaign thing. All right. So now when we're looking at COVID-19, and Dr. Ram has already emphasized what the neuropsychological effects are and what are the symptoms, whether due to the pandemic situation, due to the disease, or perhaps even due to the medication that is used for treatment purposes. Uh, let's try and also understand what are the stressors in this pandemic situation, things that we are not familiar with, and our closest um, experience for mankind has been about 100 years back with the Spanish flu, which Dr. Geller and Dr. Parekh have extensively spoken about already. Like Dr. Parekh mentioned, even before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, the WHO declared it as an infodemic as early as February of this year. Uh, there was so much misinformation and stigma related to the pandemic situation that everyone feared getting the illness and it only made the misinformation uh, create more chaos around it. Uh, when we look at the economic hardships, the International Labour Organization has declared over 190 million people have lost their job due to the pandemic situation. 
and we are looking at a gdp cost of over 9 trillion dollars uh, in our personal experience with clients as well we see that there's reduced mobility due to lockdowns uh, quarantines isolation causing increased internal frustration and there's a complete disruption of one social activity and routine a special interest is social isolation which dr ram did touch upon earlier as well uh in india it always seems as a foreign concept something that we associate with the west uh however social isolation and extensive re- research on that in the past has indicated that it leads to early morning spikes in cortisol levels it is also associated with other physical changes like increased increased blood pressure as well as mood fluctuations physical and uh, medical illnesses like heart disease diabetes anxiety depression are associated with it and it's linked to increase the risk of early death by 26% to give a reference that's the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day another stressor has been quarantine never before this time has the world seen quarantine or lockdowns of this massive scale and uh, extensive research of about 26000 participants in china of university students really uh, reveal that those placed under forced quarantine perceived discrimination and had an increased risk of infection uh, and this was associated with emotional distress depression self harm tendencies as well as suicidal ideations a similar study was done in in where over 85% of parents reported that they had seen a change in their children's emotional state as well as behaviors and a much smaller study but one done in india revealed that over 65% of children who were faced uh, who were placed in post quarantine experienced anxiety helplessness as well as fear so when someone is going through such psychological psychological distress what are warning indicators and signs to look out for we are looking at them at broadly three levels the emotional the cognitive and the behavioral anxiety fear panic sadness tearfulness these are easier to identify if you find yourself brooding too much negative thoughts and worries please hold on take a check and come back if there are uh, if there is psychological distress there it's a good idea to address it at this stage itself however in india what we are concerned about the most are the psychosomatic manifestations of increased irritability sleep and appetite disturbances uh, especially sleep has been commonly found across the world right now and if uh, it can also manifest behaviorally in checking the news phone increased restlessness as well as alcohol and substance use a uh, move further and identifying the vulnerable populations and how uh, the distress may manifest for them as well as what could help alleviate those concerns with children due to the pandemic situation in april alone over 90 90% of children globally uh, had some disruption in their school life that's over 1.6 billion children uh, they tend to so the disruption in routines tends to manifest itself as increased sensitivity they uh, one may observe conduct problems as well as regressed behavior social engagement and parental support is critical during these times and uh, it is encouraged that if parents le- are open and transparent to the extent that they can deal with information uh, with children that helps them cope better in the situation and uh, recommendations of not moving out of home or uh, they also happen to be the vulnerable population that's not very exposed and tech savvy so there's a risk of social disconnect as well as an increased fear of obtaining essential supplies community health daily check-ins and technological assistance uh, has can be used to help them manage the pandemic situation better uh, with adults females seem to suffer the brunt a lot more uh home chores and responsibilities somehow uh, globally they have been uh, it's been found fall more on the female partner and um, often that results in them having to make a choice between their home responsibilities or their occupational responsibilities with a lot of them giving up their um jobs 
also with the pandemic everyone spending so much more time at home and with everyone forced to there is an increase in divorce rate as well as an increase in uh, pregnancies which have been reported in china soon after the lockdown um, opened there and another interesting uh, information is with high risk groups these are people with pre existing uh, medical conditions like diabetes like blood pressure with them due to the pandemic and knowing that they fall in the high risk group there's excessive preoccupation with health concerns creating medical plans and regular tele- uh, telemedicine follow ups even prior to the scheduled appointment uh, can help them manage their chronic illness better and with previous mental health conditions there's an increased risk for obsessive compulsive disorder for anxiety and for depression in the us there was a study done um, uh, amongst 898 participants who self reported medical disorders or having some sort of medical illnesses prior to the pandemic times and they were found to have a six fold increased risk for depression a four to six fold increased risk for anxiety as well as a higher risk for post traumatic stress disorder as compared to those who did not have a previous mental health condition again we come back being proactive in seeking help taking tele uh, health consultations which are an option uh, much more easily and conveniently with our profession and with psychiatrists and with psychologists this can they can use and train with coping mechanisms to help them cope better since they are the more vulnerable group uh frontline workers with research even done with the sars as of 2002 and 2003 it was found that healthcare workers who were at the front line faced ptsd depression and alcohol dependence up to 3 years after the outbreak had been contained and with that statistic it really makes us wonder that with the covid-19 pandemic already spanning such a long time and affecting so many more people what is the impact going to be on frontline workers dr ram has already touched upon that uh, some of the early research indicates 22% of anxiety 23% depression sleep seems to be a concern and post traumatic stress symptoms have emerged a study done in india ha- uh, using the das scale indicates depression anxiety and stress levels are high uh an other interesting study done between singapore and india looking at five major hospitals indicated that there was an association between physical symptoms as well as psychological symptoms and this brings me back to the concern that i had mentioned earlier that in india psychosomatic manifestations are crucial to watch out for in mental health as a sign of mental health distress and they should not be left out and regular screening is going to be critical at that point how does this matter because for frontline workers specifically there is also found attention deficits decision making impairments which in turn and not if not addressed in time can affect their clinical pa- practice and in turn affect the healthcare workers ability to give the most to the patients within covid-19 those who were infected and covid-19 positive cases they have been found a us study has found 22.5% of all infected patients had neuropsychiatric manifestations as dr ram has already elaborated upon in a uk study they found that 91% of all psychiatric cases diagnosed over the past few months were new diagnoses they were people who had not experienced mental health concerns or conditions prior to the pandemic and that is also another indicator to us that uh, the upcoming outbreak or the up- the upcoming epidemic or the upcoming mental health pandemic is real and we should carefully watch out for it post traumatic stress syndrome was reported in over 96% of patients in another study and in india there was uh, a study done for asymptomatic positive cases who were pay, uh, who were put under quarantine and isolation and even though they were asymptomatic 74% of them reported stress almost 50% of them reported depression and 40% reported anxiety 
uh, with economic strain oh, and over 190 million people who have lost their jobs through this pandemic. And the second quarter of uh, the year has proven to be much worse for, economic, for the economy than the first quarter that links immediately to the increased risk of suicide that we may see. Um, with domestic abuse, world over, different studies have been conducted and there are reports between 20 to 35 percent of increase in the domestic cases, uh, uh, domestic abuse cases that have been reported. In India itself, in the first week after the lockdown situation, there was a, a news article which reported that there's a 52 percent increase in the domestic abuse reports. Looking at the pandemic situation, which has affected even the general population due to the lockdowns, it has been observed in China. A lot of studies of meta analysis show between 7 and 53% of the population reported facing psychological distress. It is important to know that the one of the largest studies amongst that was of 52,000 uh, participants and 35% of them wrote, uh, reported psychological distress. That is similar to what the statistics are showing from Spain. That is similar to the range that is showing in India. In fact, in India, the lockdown has also been for a much longer time. And that may explain why the distress levels in India are much higher. Uh, the 74.1% psychological distress, which we are seeing here, is from the one of the studies that Dr. Dalal mentioned, which has been reported by the uh, Indian Psychiatric Society. And that study also, uh, which it's a large scale study of over 1600 participants. And in that we see that almost 40% of them, of the participants reported depression and or anxiety. These are individuals who have not tested COVID positive, just the general population based on the effects of the pandemic and the other things fully. Oh, what is interesting and what I found most surprising is that 80% in a study done in India, 80% of individuals felt the need of getting professional help from mental health experts. And that, I think, is a very interesting trend and hopefully perhaps indicates a change in mindset and the stigma that has surrounded mental health over all these decades and we've all tried so very hard to fight. Now, how does one cope with the situation? I will be discussing some general uh, emotional strategies, cognitive strategies, as well as behavioral strategies that one could implement in your daily life and one could recommend to clients as well. If one finds, however, that despite these, one is unable to cope, uh, it is always advisable to seek a mental health professional's uh, guidance. Now, when we're discussing emotional strategies, it's important to know whether we are responding to the situation or simply reacting to it. Very often, if you find yourself very angry, very emotionally labile, it is important to hold back and breathing, relaxation exercises, meditation, yoga, mindfulness, distraction, dis distraction strategies can be very helpful to regulate, uh, to regulate one's emotional status. And then apply some of the cognitive strategies where knowledge is power. We are looking at reliable information from accurate sources. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the concept of social versus physical distancing, which Dr. Parik and Dr. Ram have both discussed previously. Uh, these are difficult times. It is important to be compassionate and to empathize with oneself as well as others. Uh, and that I feel is an important trick or tip that I would suggest, especially for within our families, within household setups where everyone is spending a lot more time together. Uh, the writing in a diary or discussing with a close confidant is always a good idea. This is where I feel in the Indian setup, our social fabric can be a great support system and strength to help understand our concerns, to see whether our concerns are rational, and instead of focusing on our worries or the problems, to switch towards a solution focus to help us cope and deal better. When we're looking at behavioral strategies, again, like Dr. Ram said, stay connected to family, friends. Self-care is critical. Exercise, sleep, nutrition. Following a routine can help one get going with one's time. A lot of people 
uh, are struggling to cope in these times and are falling out of routines which is aggravating the problems there's a lot more uh, sleep cycle disruptions which we are observing and that if addressed can really be helpful as well altruism when one is worried and one is concerned and finds oneself lost helping others can help uh, create a sense of purpose and make one feel good in these distressing times as well and uh, a lot of us wait for the pandemic to get over to restart your life and there can be a trap in that because based on what dr ram mentioned based on what dr parik mentioned earlier this seems like it is here to last and the effects are going to be seen for a really long time from now so what we would suggest is make the most of your situation now don't wait for it to end and your life to be in this pause state and once it all gets over you restart start now within the constraints of your city within the constraints of your situation a uh, focus on family time reading books you know watching tv movies that you miss uh listening to music skills um uh, you know pursuing one's hobbies and yes if you're free attending some webinars like this one too and for that i would like to thank each one of you just a final glimpse of what lies ahead based on a meta analysis of uh, over 65 studies that have been done over the corona virus uh, outbreaks in the past where those who were infected were seen to have depressed mood insomnia anxiety irritability memory fatigue traumatic memory sleep disorders these are things we have to watch out for as we move forward and i'd like to end my talk by leaving a question to each one on this forum in terms of what can we do better and what are the possible collaborations we could look at to address these concerns and brace ourselves to better manage the situation that lies ahead for all of us with that thank you so much for having me Uh, thank you to uh, all the uh, speakers. Uh, they have answered an incredible number of uh, our questions. Uh, I do have one quick question. Uh, Dr. Preek, you never told us if you saw the tiger. You should have guessed. If I had, I would have boasted about it. The closest we came were to seeing the paw. Paw print of the tiger, uh, but uh, you know, just waiting to see the tiger helped us to think about the book and the pandemic. Maybe the uh, tiger is the pandemic. Could be. Uh, and I also want to bring to everybody's attention. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ram mentioned a quote from uh, Yogi Berra, who was a uh, catcher for the New York Yankees. Uh, Uh, another one of his quotes. It's a different one that I mentioned previously, and this one is particularly appropriate to the COVID pandemic. He said, "You've got to be very careful if you don't know where you are going, because you might not get there." Uh, and that seems to be an encapsulation of exactly where we are right now. So we have a, a series of questions, and if you'll indulge me, I'd like to ask the first one. And I'd like to ask uh, Mara what she sees as the future for India at the same time you told us that there's been an uh, incredible economic decline with long lasting effects. You told us. indirectly that the birth rate is increasing because the pregnancy rate is increasing so what do you see with declining economy and an increasing population thank you dr gela for your question uh, the study i was referring to about an increase in birth rate was one done from china and i'd like to add that there was also an increase in divorce rates that were uh, being seen um how does that impl- i i do not uh, i'm wondering sometimes if in india we needed the pandemic to lead or to result in a spurt in birth rate oh, that's been happening here anyway and um 
But coming back to the concern of the economics and how do we see that moving forward, uh, we don't really know. And that's the truth of it. But what I would like to, uh, what may be of help as a reference is going back to the past and learning some lessons from there. And uh, for that, I'd like to quote a study done by uh, Vernon and colleagues back about the Spanish flu, where they observed that um, with a, it was a study done in the United States, looking how uh, different states responded to the Spanish flu pandemic. And over there, they observed that a uh, particular interest is Cleveland and Philadelphia. And Cleveland was one of the states which looked at closing down really early and taking the necessary precautions and being very cautious before reopening during the Spanish flu. Whereas Philadelphia uh, went into a lockdown and took precautionary measures much later in the pandemic. And they even were very eager to start back early. And directly, this correlated, or perhaps not directly, but this correlated in the following year after the Spanish flu had ended, they observed that Cleveland had a growth rate of 5%, whereas Philadelphia, which tried to, you know, uh, hold on as long as they could before they closed down, tried to reopen early to boost their economy, actually saw only a mere 2% increase in growth. And I think uh, there lies an important lesson for all of us as well. Thank you. Uh, I don't know about India, but the United States, the birth rate and the divorce rate are entirely independent variables. <laughs> Not so much in India. <laughs> Not so much in India. Okay. Dr. Parikh has a question about, uh, is a DNA vaccine any advantage over an IR, IR, uh, sorry, RNA vaccine? Uh, well, first of all, I don't really know, but uh, the little bit that I know, uh, there was a interesting article that we read while uh, writing the book, and it's an April 2019 article by Margaret Liu uh, from California. It's in a Swiss journal called Vaccine. Uh, so we just looked at that article, and it actually compares the DNA and the RNA vaccines. Uh, here's what I can recollect, but I may stand corrected. Uh, first of all, DNA vaccines have been around much longer than RNA vaccines. RNA vaccines are relatively new. Uh, if I may digress a moment, the big distinction actually is between previous viruses and the DNA RNA. Because earlier, for a virus, you uh, for a vaccine, you needed either an attenuated, which is a weakened virus, or a dead virus. You use the entire virus. For DNA and RNA, rather than using the entire virus dead or alive, one uses and sometimes even synthesizes a segment, a segment of the DNA or the RNA. So it's a very, very small dose which can be given. Uh, DNA vaccines, I recollect in that article, are used largely even today in veterinary uh, science because you know there are rampant uh, epidemics amongst animals. RNA is relatively new. Uh, both are much easier to administer than the other vaccines. I think one advantage the RNA vaccines have, other than having been around for a longer period of time, is I believe they're more stable. Uh, this becomes uh, stable to temperature, so that liability is less. Uh, this becomes important in large areas of the world where maintaining the cold chain in the vaccine poses its own uh, monumental challenges. This is what I recollect. But uh, I'll just quickly check the article as we go along. Uh, and it's in vaccine. Uh, Myra, correct me if I'm wrong. Vaccine of 2019 April. Uh, thank you. That was a, a very informative and lengthy answer that started with I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, we'll move on. <laughs> uh, thank you. Mara, this question I think is directed to you. Uh, or anybody else could please join in. COVID 19 resulted in a lot of unemployment. How much mm -hmm. time will it take to come back to pre COVID levels? I am going to keep this one short. I do not know. I do not know, but I would estimate it would be years to come. Uh, I can only shed some light on what an economist uh, explained to me. Uh, you know, if you have a, a, a twenty percent decline, and then you have a twenty percent recovery you're not at the same place. 
right? So if you start with 100 and you have a 20% decline, you go to 80. You have a 20% recovery, you only go to 96. So you need a higher percentage recovery than you had declined to get back to baseline, which is part of the challenge. Um, Dr. Ram, some, uh, a question about management of sleep disorders. Management of sleep disorders during COVID-19. The most exciting research is the paper on the use of melatonin. Uh, there has been a fair amount of understanding that managing the circadian rhythm and using melatonin has been beneficial. There are ongoing studies. I would refer you to the article from Mass General, which uh, the short reference is NeuroCOVID. It is still in the pre-publication stage, but is available online on psychosomatics. So I think melatonin holds a, a lot of uh, potential therapeutic benefit in helping delirious and other uh, manifestations of psychiatric symptoms in COVID patients, largely because given this amount of medications they're going to receive for the treatment of COVID, you want to, you want to be quite conservative and use one or two sleep medications and not risk using things like benzodiazepines, which obviously will produce respiratory depression. Thank you. Uh, Mara, this question I think is in code. Would you share references 1924 and 34, please? And sure. Rep 36 reported 80% seeking help. So maybe that sure. person could email you. Sure. I'm just okay. going to do that. Uh, Parikh, uh, any, yes, specific, psych, any specific psychiatric medications that were shown useful in the neuropsychiatric symptoms in COVID-19? Uh -huh. Okay, this time I'm going to say I don't know and not give a lengthy answer. I will try to, I, I would refer people Thank to, you. <laughs> I will refer people to the excellent article, which is in a pre-publication stage in psychosomatics. Uh, the senior author is Carrie Ernst, E-R-N-S-T. Um, and I have to tell you that this paper is most comprehensive about all of the all of the issues that we uh, address in psychiatry, use of clozapine during a time when white cell counts are not being done as routinely, at least in the United States, all of these issues are being addressed in one single paper. Uh, I, I will certainly make sure that we put the full reference, but there is no full reference ready yet because it's a pre-publication, uh, but it is available if you Google Kerry Ernst Psychosomatics and psychopharmacology for COVID-19, you should be able to find it. Thank you. Uh, uh, just one thing I'd like to add, Ram, and this is again a fairly hazy recollection, but there has been an impetus now on another generation of lifestyle drugs like Prozac, for example, uh, drugs which look at addressing loneliness. What are the molecules that make people feel less lonely because you know, loneliness is the, uh, ne it's the current epidemic across the world. And there's a bunch of molecules, I think, which are being researched for that. Uh, so on that answer, I kind of partly uh, clear. But uh, Jeff, I cleared my cognitive test. I just checked up. It was indeed Margaret Liu. It was indeed in a journal called Vaccines, April 2019, for the DNA, RNA. So I can name an elephant, and I'm a genius. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> for that self-congratulatory comment. Yes, uh, that's a trend. Dr. Dalal, Dr. Dalal, I think this one goes to you. Um, yeah. Okay, wait a minute, here's the question. How does, one, how does one bridge the gap between the lack of access to technology and internet and the importance of telepsychiatry going forward? When uh, there are different school of thoughts as far as telepsychiatry is concerned i would say the older generation people are who are not that computer savvy they are saying that this is this is not the way without seeing the patient without uh, uh, in person seeing and without making face to face and talking to him he will not be satisfied and the, and the 
and the other newer generation is uh, getting popular i would say that we what uh, the telepsychiatry in india it is saying that if the first time for the first time if a person has to consult then it has to be on video conferencing first consult has to be on video conferencing where you will come to know about what are the things if the informant is there he ca he can be i mean his he can give history and the and the, and the person himself the patient himself can give and you can do limited amount of mental status examination and there are certain medicines basic medicines which one is uh, uh, is able to write in during first consult all the i mean other medications generally some medications are reserved for follow up consults and the, and the follow up the person can uh, can do for 6 months after 6 months he has to again come for video conference the second thing is that that if uh, Wait, let me just interrupt you one minute the set, all those subsequent appointments can be by telephone is that correct by by uh, first by uh, of course video con conferencing and then yeah. by telephone or by message or by message thank you okay go ahead and 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 then the next next is that that one can prescribe medications of course if there is a healthcare worker around the person that is a doctor or a nurse if he or she is there with the patient then through him or her one can really see and prescribe the the medications tell the doctor or the healthcare worker about um, all all diagnosis about what what uh, prescription and this can this uh, thing is there in telepsychiatry the other thing is writing a prescription and sending it to a uh, um, uh, 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 medical store because medicines are at times not uh, available or what prescription you are writing probably you will have to write the name of the molecule so that when the patient takes it to the to the medical store there the, the one can even consult with the doctor and whatever if it if a substitute is possible then he can again write it down and and the person gets it because at times it becomes very very difficult that whatever the molecule the doctor writes they are available or not available that is also a part of the question so this way it is it is in the phase of evolution i would say and uh, as i told you that we are uh, on a on a online survey and we are uh, from the psychiatrist and we are trying to get their responses that how they are feeling whether they are feeling confident and whether they are whether they want to uh, add or delete the first consult medications and the follow up medications so the time will tell after uh, after the survey is over and it is being analyzed well, thank you uh we only have a couple of minutes i don't think actually it's there, time there, there is a question to uh, uh uh i would say dr ram is that uh, i have seen many patients post covid having cognitive decline or pseudo dementia like symptoms please comment autopsy studies as well as post mortem mri studies have shown multiple areas of the brain being affected especially the cerebral cortex the frontal areas as well as the hippocampal areas all of these suggest that covid affects the brain the virus itself is not present but there are micro emboli which are noticed these suggest that there is going to be long term consequences in cognitive decline for all patients who are infected even mildly one of the interesting points raised by uh, the autopsy study showed that people who died very early in their illness also had brain infarcts microemboli and so uh, i think it's very important to remember this and i think we will learn a lot more as we go along and we should be alert to look for everything at every uh, visit uh, ram a quick question are you alluding to the new england journal of medicine uh, study which looked at 18 18 autopsied brains correct 
That's it was a summary of it was covered in Washington Post. For those of you okay. who are able to access it, uh, all the studies were put together in Washington Post, and they separated it as heart, lungs, and brain. And uh, yeah. I, I thought it was a very well uh, done autopsy study. We are at, at, at the end, about at the end of our time. Um, I just want to make a, a one or two sentence closing remark, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dalal to uh, make a closing remark. Uh, and I wanted to re refer back to uh, Yogi Berra uh, and provide you with another appropriate quote because it exactly explains our current situation. And he said, we made too many wrong mistakes. <laughs> Dr. Dalal. <laughs> so I, as far as the closing remarks are concerned, I would say excellent uh, presentations by all the th three presenters, uh, Dr. Parekh, Dr. Ram, and uh, Mera. And uh, uh, I, I would thank Professor Geller also for uh, giving his time and uh, giving opening remarks as well as moderating very nicely the, the whole session. And at the end of the uh, end of this webinar, I mean, it uh, it should be a series of webinars. But what I would like to say that, as everybody has said, that it is the time will only tell as as we go along that what are the the, the physical things as the advisories are changing. Similarly, uh, findings are also changing. That the physical findings, the mental findings, uh, and uh, they are being concretizing gradually. And uh, let us see uh, how it pans out, as has been said in post-COVID. I would only like to add one thing: that the that uh, millions of people who migrated from one place to another, hungry, without slippers, without clothes, having having children on their on their back, carried out. But the studies, the Indian studies, which were carried out on them on, and the few of the NGOs who worked with, with them, they did not find more uh, prevalence of more anxiety or depression in them. So th there comes the question of resilience. So we will have to be very, very um, positive about it and try to bring about resilience so that uh, we all or the or the mankind bounces back the economy bounces back and uh, we hope for the best thank you thank you thank you, so I much. Just want to say thank you to everybody um, especially dr geller and dr talal rajesh and mahera you are always very special to me so i will thank you later Thank you. Thank you. And Thank goodbye. You. Another one Thank of these you. will be very special to me, too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thanks. Or a good morning, Ram. Have, have a good you. evening and good morning. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.